and your heart should not be troubled. Laura Ingram, we looked, we listened, we didn't hear your call today. Okay, well, first of all, I tried to call back about, I don't know, six minutes ago. It fills up. Do you ever clear the voicemails? We I tried it, to leave a message. It's all fast. full, constantly full. You have a lot of haters. They don't like you out there, Sean. Uh, uh, listen, as long as they're watching, that's all we asked. Four hours I mean, a day of your life, that's all. But I like the fact that that guy who left the message, Sean, said F and not the whole wor word. So you're, you're really making progress with your haters out yeah, there. We're so. making a lot of progress here, but uh, we can handle it. We'll take it. The Ingram angle starts right now. Big news tonight, Laura. All right. Thanks so much, Sean. And good evening from Washington. I'm Laura Ingram, and this is the Ingram Angle. We have massive news to share with you tonight. You're going to want to stay tuned for the entire hour. If you have to go to the bathroom, pause us because you're not going to want to miss this. We have the, the DACA negotiations reaching a fever pitch. It's an issue so many of you care about, and the president is not budging. We're going to have the real analysis of what the Democrats and some of their pals in the Republican Party are trying to ram through. And we're going to get into that, uh, I guess, explosive comment the president made in the Oval Office. And first, Silicon Valley came after conservatives, and now they're coming after you. And by the way, Chicago residents, we're going to get to this, revolt over the Obama library plans. We have one of the men behind the pushback here with us tonight. Plus, we have exclusive details on some of the most vile, heinous crimes ever committed by illegal immigrants. And we're the only show doing this story tonight. We have exclusive details about something that happened in Denver, Colorado. But first, the Durban Graham Flake DACA bill travesty, that is the subject of tonight's angle. As I predicted, this Gang of Six bill is a complete and utter joke. Earlier in the week, the president empowered congressional leaders to come up with a bipartisan deal to address the status of those 800,000 or so dreamers that Obama, through executive action, protected from deportation. Remember, there were some prerequisites. Build the wall, add more border agents and immigration judges, and end chain migration and the visa lottery. But today, Senators Dick Durbin, Lindsey Graham, and Jeff Flake unveiled their great compromise. The moment I heard it was those three involved, I knew it was going to be bad, by the way. If you're wondering why the president has already, in the words of Dick Durbin, personally rejected the bill, I'll tell you why. It would increase chain migration, violating one of the president's non-negotiables, number one. The DACA recipients get citizenship and can then sponsor relatives and their parents for renewable three-year periods. The money for border enforcement is, as I predicted, a pittance. $2.3 billion is all Durbin, Graham, and Flake offered. And by the way, only $1.6 billion will go toward the construction of the wall or the double fencing. And what are they supposed to build the wall with? Styrofoam for that much money? A real border wall is expected to cost about $20 billion. And while Congress anguishes to find the money, well, by the way, remember, we're going to rebuild Puerto Rico for about $50 billion, and illegals cost us all in about $113 billion a year. So do not tell me we don't have the money to enforce our own border. The bipartisan proposal placed new constraints on the Department of Homeland Security that will hamper the actual building of the wall. And this really tortures me. The visa lottery would simply be transferred to temporary protective status, meaning those visas would result in even more lower-skilled immigrants coming into the country. The bar is even lower for that group. So I suggest that the great bipartisan working group sharpen their pencils and return to the table. This will not do. No way, no how. Again, it would increase chain migration, it would lead to more immigration, and it would spike the number of low-skilled immigrant workers. This is a bill the president should love, right? Oh, the president of Mexico, that is. <laughs> Republicans should run, not walk away from it. 
just like in 2006, 2007, 2013, and 2014, open borders, the open borders bipartisan cartel tries to trick the American people every time. Well, guess what? We're not Charlie Brown and you're not Lucy. But Donald Trump is not going to be led down this garden path on this one. No way. During the presidential election, Lindsey Graham got 1% of the vote in his home state of South Carolina during the primaries. Yes, 1%. And Jeff Flake himself is so unpopular in Arizona, he was forced to retire rather than face the electorate. Let's face it. The immigration views of Flake and Graham are not popular, and the president should not tie his bright political future to these walking anvils. They're just going to sink them right down. For a real perspective on immigration, the president should listen to the voices of the silent majority that I heard loud and clear once again on my radio show today. These days, you don't find one African American on the work site in any Atlanta subdivision. It's a, it's a shame. It's all Hispanic. It's all illegal. Their equity price again is built on illegal labor. There are plentitude of illegal labor, holding wages down for the Americans. A lot of guys think that, oh, why don't these guys get off the corner of Chicago or Chicago is such a carnage for all this crime and all this uh, gun violence, but there's so many illegals in Chicago right now. It's so, it's so hard for anyone to get a job. The people know how high the stakes are right now, and they're already living with the results of open borders policies by the way, that were supported by the same politicians pushing this bad deal on Trump. America, my friends, is being and has been completely transformed culturally, economically, and electorally by illegal and chain migration. And by the way, MS-13 is still proliferating. This is precisely what Americans rejected in the last presidential election. It's one of the major reasons Trump won. Nobody wants America to be the next hole. I guess we decided to bleep that. If what Graham and Flake are pushing is so popular, then and, and it's so right, it's so common sense, why are they all so afraid to come on this show and defend their proposal? We, we get no uh, callbacks from any of them. I wonder why. And that's the angle. Joining me now for reaction from West Palm Beach, Florida, is best-selling author Ann Coulter. And with me here in Washington, D.C., is Mark Krikorian, the executive director for the Center for Immigration Studies. And also in Washington is Jonathan Swan. He's a national political reporter for Axios. Uh, Jonathan, let's start with you. Uh, I did some reporting tonight before the show on what happened in that meeting. Uh, without belaboring the point on what the president said inside, this bill does not go close at all, in my mind, to reaching those non-negotiables that President Trump has set out very clearly. Well, you saw it from the start. I looked up at the television this morning and it said, flake, colon, we have struck a deal on immigration. You could not have had a worse messenger for that deal than Jeff Flake for a start. Secondly, as soon as I knew that it was Flake, Durbin and Graham, I was like, okay, well, where's Tom Cotton? Where's Purdue? Where are some of these other people that the president wants to listen to? And the way today played out was uh, Durbin and Graham were going to go to the White House. They had it all planned out. They were going to meet with the president. They show up, they go into the cabinet room, and the doors swing open, and in walks Cotton, Purdue, Goodlatte. Bob Goodlatte. And they freaked. They were like, oh, OK. <laughs> and then the real conversation happens, which is obviously that the deal that was presented this morning. I mean, but is Dur exactly Durbin and Flake, uh, Ann Coulter, I want to go to you. Uh, do they think the president, they must think the president is stupid. They're going to walk into this meeting and try to buffalo Trump on immigration on these points. <laughs> Jeff Flake didn't vote for President Trump, and he wrote a whole book trashing him. And he's like, well, I have the idea, Mr. President. We're going to increase chain migration and do all these things. And take it away. Yes, and as you say, he's so popular in his home state, he can't run for re-election. These politicians, they are like drug addicts. I don't know what the American people have to do. <laughs> Three times Congress has tried to slip through amnesty in the last 10 years in the dead of night. Luckily, it's now people are paying attention. Um, and all three times it was shut down, not by a major network, not by one particular politician. Somehow it leaked out. And the American people shut down congressional switchboards. We just put 
a reality TV star developer in the White House. Some would say he is not the typical president. Why? Because he talked about Mexican rapists and promised to build a wall. I thought on November 8th, all these Republicans in Washington need to send, see like trucks of depends being sent in because they'd be so afraid of what the public was saying to them. I, I, I mean, my final thing I would say about this is, remember Ross Perot had this idea, it just occurred to me when you were talking about it, where you'd have like national referenda on certain issues. I so wish we could have a secret ballot national referenda on immigration, on any amnesty, on Dreamers amnesty, on amnesty for anyone, on the wall. I mean, I think we did that on November 8th, but um, wow, these pot the Republicans want their donors and the Democrats want the vote. I mean, it, it, Mark Kerkorian, I actually am surprised. They didn't even try to dress this up yeah. as something that's different. It's actually worse than the Gang of Eight bill. It's actually worse than that was in many respects because it, it, it directly increases chain migration by allowing these 800,000 to sponsor, uncles, aunts, adult children, all this. And then the parents get to stay for three year revolving, rotating periods of time. I mean, when I read about this, it really seemed to me almost consciously contemptuous of what the president wanted to do. Look, the whole Do you think they, they're trying to blow it up on purpose? No, no, no. I think they think he really is a moron and they can push him around. I mean, it's just it's unbelievable. They actually when he when he said I'll do whatever you guys want when right. and when he made I think that they took that comment, literally. I guess they did, but was, they've been working on this mark for months. And right. this is what these bozos, I'm sorry to be uncharitable, come up with? And you know what was maybe really struck me was the whole for 15 years the whole argument for the dreamers and daca is that they didn't commit a crime they came as kids right. weren't legally responsible well this bill amnesties their parents too who didn't come as children who brought them here i mean it is I, 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 I thought it was a joke at first, I have to admit. I did not think this was serious. Uh, now, Jonathan, uh, Congressman Pramila Jayapal from Washington State made a comment today directly at this issue of chain migration. Let's watch. This idea that chain migration is real is really only something that people who know nothing about immigration um, will say because chain migration doesn't, for the most part, exist. I, I, you know, it took me 18 years to get my citizenship. If I had tried to get my parents to come here as a U.S. citizen, it would have taken uh, many more years. Uh, Jonathan, doesn't exist at all. It's only 44% of all green card recipients this past year were from chain migration, and another 23% mark were from other family-based immigration. Right. Only 18% were jobs-related. Yeah. I don't even know what to make of that. I was so wrong. <laughs> My eyes were bulging watching that clip. But that's how the immigration in the United States has ballooned over the years, and it's ballooned beyond what anyone had ever thought. And Anne... You know, we have this story um, that we're going to get to next segment about something that just happened in Denver, Colorado. Now, as you know, media outlets do not dig for immigration status on these crimes. So you have to, like, call, like, three or four people. You get transferred, and then finally you find someone who said, yeah, by the way. Da -da. So we did that. We're going to reveal that next segment. But th this, the, just the issue of crime alone is something that we yes. have to keep front and center because that directly relates to the American people. Yes, well, that's how um, Adios America became my book on immigration, became a book on immigration. I, it was only going to be one chapter, and I go to look up, you know, what would any country want to know about the people it's bringing in? Legal immigrants we're talking about here. Well, how many are in prison, and what countries are they from? No, the government specifically suppresses that information. The media isn't asking any questions, and then they turn around and blow up at a comment like Trump's. Well, from the information in Adios America, um, actually, Haitians do seem to be wildly overrepresented in our prison system, and Norwegians really quite underrepresented. And I notice only one side of this debate wants to know the facts. It's our side who keeps saying, hey, could you just count? It's, it's not that hard to figure out how many immigrants are in prison. Could you count them? Right. Well, we, there's a story coming out tomorrow specifically about Arizona, which will be hitting tomorrow. Jonathan, who has the president's ear on immigration in the White House? Stephen Miller is uh, one of the last of the, right. I think, original Trumpites right. in the White House. There's a couple of others, but not many, yeah. uh, just on this particular issue. Um, is Stephen Miller, does he have influence? I know yeah. the president has his, is his own man. He runs yeah, his yeah. own show. 
but Miller is one of the experts on this issue. Yeah, Miller has a lot of influence and he's really the only one in the White House who actually really understands this issue and has studied it in a very careful way. John Kelly obviously cares about border enforcement, but he doesn't, he doesn't know immigration policy like Stephen Miller does. But, you know, everyone obsesses over the palace intrigue and the infighting. This is actually one of those issues where Trump himself has very strong, hardwired instincts and has done for a long time, immigration and trade. And so, yes, there are moderate liberals in there like Gary Cohn and Jared Navanka who would be horrified by the comment he made today, but they've basically given up trying to really, f I mean, they know where this is heading and where the president's instinct. And Mark, are. the president's instinct on this issue was always derided and reviled by the establishment. They called him racist, xenophobic. They're still doing it. And they'll do it even, even if he agreed to something like this. They, do, they did it yesterday. So the president sticks to his, uh, his, his instincts on this. If you want to get rid of chain migration, you want, then maybe he has to do some deal on DACA. But it has to be verifiable. There have to be real triggers. It can't be this. You know, the Goodlatte bill, we don't have time to get into it, is a lot closer. Oh, it's, much, it's a much better bill, there's no question. And the president's instincts, the way I think about it, is that he's sort of the man on the street on immigration. That's kind of, he's in the White House, but his views Listen to and those his callers. Instincts Listen are the to man those callers. Street. Those exactly. are African American and two women. Right. A young African American male in Chicago, and I believe it was two, one woman and, and, a, and a man. And those are representative, by the way, the calls into my show today. These are people, a lot of them are like, I'm not even political. I don't even follow Fusion GPS. But on this issue, I've seen my opportunities shrink, and I've seen the country change, and we didn't vote for any of this. I'm not racist. I believe in immigration, but this is wrong. And I'm telling you, people are mad. I don't care what they say about DACA polls. People are livid about this, and I think the president gets it. I really do. Uh, everybody, uh, by the way, great segment. Uh, Ann and Mark, stay right there. This conversation is continuing over something the president said. We referenced it in the Oval Office about a con countries where certain illegal immigrants come from and legal immigrants do not move. President Trump has driven much of the mainstream media bonkers once again. Fox News is among a number of outlets that confirmed a Washington Post report that during an Oval Office meeting with lawmakers on immigration today, that one we were just talking about, uh, Trump balked at that deal and said, and I substitute one particular word here, why are we having all these people from blank hole countries come here? The president was reportedly referring to the countries of Haiti, El Salvador, and of course that's the home of MS-13, mind you, and some African nations. CNN completely freaked out. The president seems to harbor racist uh, feelings about people of color uh, from other parts of the world. The president has racist views. I mean, you know, when, how long do we have to dance around that, that issue? Jeffrey Tubin talking about dancing is not something I ever want to think about. Let's bring back Ann Coulter and Mark Krikorian and also welcome immigration attorney Michael Wilds in New York. Uh, Ann, let's go to you on this issue of the blank hole countries. Because he said that, Tubin and Acosta go right to the same old trope they tried in 2016. Donald Trump is obvious, obviously then harboring ill will toward uh, people of color. Um, right, and don't change the channel from Laura's show, but this is the funnest night to watch CNN since election <laughs> night. <laughs> it's fantastic. Um, that's not Thanks, good Sam. enough. I do still, <laughs> I do still want a wall. So he's not going to win me back with just you know his rhetoric again. He said he's going to build a wall a million times. Not until we actually see the wall. But uh, you know, I think it's worth mentioning. Um, this is exactly what all of the Democratic sponsors of the 1965 Immigration Act promised us. Teddy Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy. The Washington Post, Emanuel Sellers swore up and down. This Immigration Act will not change the ethnic composition of America. We will not be overwhelmed by immigrants from Asia, from Africa, from the Caribbean, from any one country. They swore up and down. In fact, the 1965 Immigration Act, and their quotes, by the way, are all in yeah. Adios America, they're acted exactly the opposite of that. Basically, Western European immigration was shut down. We were overwhelmed with the third world. Now, if anybody complains about it, they call are you a racist? Well, no, we're just saying we can we hold. Was Teddy Kennedy a racist for saying it wouldn't do all of the
the things it did. Um, right, no, manifestly, it's true. We want Westerners who can speak English. Um, just one thing on your, you were talking about how they don't have enough money for the wall. I was thinking when, when you were saying that, you know, as long as these countries are such fantastic countries, maybe we could get, you know, cut off the foreign aid to all of them and use that for the wall. Or tax remittances or shut down remittances to other countries altogether. I mean, they send uh, $20 billion out of the country, 50% tax, you get $10 billion right there. Michael, I want to go to you on this. Your reaction to the president's uh, reported comment. Well, I, I, I first thank you, Laura, for having me on again. I, I have to say, just for context, I happen to have been the president's immigration lawyer for over 10 years, acting on behalf of Trump models and Miss Universe and so forth. A staunch a Democrat, I still represent actually Mrs. Trump. I have to tell you that I was disappointed by the words and the tone. I did not believe the president to be a bigot. I think this is a contentious issue. And a president should be speaking in a presidential capacity with better choice of words. But the fact is that the dialogue has deteriorated. We have, unfortunately, leaders in this nation in both houses that have not done anything to fix this broken immigration system. It's festering. And, you know, family reunification was a hallmark of the 1965 Act. It's now been given a derogatory term of chain migration. So we got a lot of things to fix. Guys, without interrupting, let me just say something. We have 50,000 lottery visas, and we have 10,000 people getting EB-5s where they put a million dollars in and buy green cards effectively. Yes, there's some things that we need to do. They want to drop brothers and sisters and in, in exchange put in a yeah. merit-based special visa for entrepreneurs. I'm all for you know, adding more yeah. venues to get legal immigrants. I don't think we want criminals in MS-13 here. All right. Well, let, let me get into that because we promised our viewers we would share some information tonight that we uncovered today. I, I was going around the Internet. I logged on the Denver Post website. It's an interesting website. They report on some cool issues that I care about. Uh, and crime is one of them. And there was a major heroin bust in Colorado this week. There's a 61-count indictment against six individuals. Now, we called over, and I guess we transferred a few times around. We found out that uh, in addition to the main suspect, uh, Flores Rosales, 47-year-old Cristobal Flores Rosales, uh, Juan Borges Meza, uh, Mario Acosta Ruiz, and Yuel Soto Campos, and Jose Torres Espinoza are all illegal immigrants. This was a $264,000 uh, worth of drugs, uh, including heroin. Uh, we know what heroin is doing to our youth. We know it's doing to our societies. It is poisoning them. Uh, that's just one example. Uh, and that's why it matters, because Get real them. lives are affected. And how many of these kids could be DACA recipients if Lots. they hadn't been busted in a heroin ring? Laura, Michael, yeah. they could receive DACA amnesty, could they not? Laura, get these criminals out. Get this insidiousness, the opioids, why should, no, the Michael, heroin, Michael, Michael, get Michael. them out. Why, but why are you should going our to, law are, enforcement... Are you going to conflate 900,000 yes, innocents yes. with MS-13? No, 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 no. What, Michael, here's what you could do. You know, again, this might work in your, in your law practice. It doesn't work with me. These are individuals who are taxing our police, our district attorneys, our government services they cannot by get poisoning DACA our if youth. If they're criminals, they cannot oh, get Oh, they're all DACA. valedictorians, right? Michael, Michael cannot, uh, Kerkorian, they, Mark Kerkorian. They there's, shouldn't be in this country. They, they shouldn't have been allowed in this DACA. country. And they never should be here. There's they cannot get the DACA if issue. they're criminals. There's, yeah, there's because we caught the, them. How many didn't we catch? There's two points on the crime issue that are relevant here. You have the um, supporters of big immigration. Say immigrants, when you add them all together, they're not that much more likely or less likely to be criminals than Americans when you add them all together. That might be true. We don't know, because Ann said the data doesn't exist. They don't collect it. There are two points that matter here. One, illegal immigrants shouldn't be here, so one crime is too many. One life, one American life isn't worth it. And immigrant communities, even though most of the people are perfectly innocent, they serve as kind of cover for rings like this. These guys were not operating out in some suburban place. They were in an immigrant I, I, community. I have to share may, another, may another anecdote. This is very important. This happened uh, about 10 miles from Washington, D.C., where we're broadcasting from right now. Go back to Valentine's Day of last year. Female MS-13 gang member, 17 years of age, had another girl in her grips and stabbed her multiple times, killing her. She went on tape. The confession was taped and released to local five news, uh, Fox 5 here in Washington. Watch. 
Do you need to tell me what you did to her? I killed her. How did you kill her? With a knife. She said to her also, uh, you'll see me again in hell. Don't forget my name. All reported, all admitted to, another life that shouldn't have been taken, that should, shouldn't have been, this should never have happened, and you can take it away here, but I'm telling you, any destruction of life, property, rape, child, child abuse, DWI, why do the American people have to tolerate this so liberals feel better about themselves and their electoral uh, chances and, and Republicans get cheap labor? Why? Right, and they're not living in those neighborhoods. Um, that happened last year? No, that, that was this year. This year. Just okay, happened. so that's in yeah. Trump's America. So, you know, we do have, if you could flash back to Trump promising oh, that, uh, the, the confession angel was just released. The killing happened in Valentine's Day of last year. Yeah, in Valentine's the, Day of 2017. The parents of the children murdered by illegal aliens, Trump said, brought them up on stage, God bless them, first time most Americans have even heard of them, and said yep. over and over again, I won't forget you, I won't betray you. These killings going forward, if Trump does not keep his promises on immigration by building a wall and deporting illegals, these are going to be his Kate Steinleys. Now, now this is on his record. The next Pulse nightclub, that's going to be his. And he better remember the people who put him there. Laura, All right, guys. Yeah, Laura, if I may. real quick, Michael, go ahead. I, 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 it, the dialogue has deteriorated, sadly, where you're giving the impression to everybody that most foreigners or immigrants are criminals. No, DACA fact, recipients cannot opposite. be criminals, and I'm telling you right now, scaring we the hell out of know. America is not in good taste. Michael, Michael, <laughs> yes. what if that Only were your daughter? Wants to know. What if that were your daughter with with 12 knife wounds in her neck? What would you be saying? Would you be coming on this show saying, "Oh, the poor DACA kids"? Laura, I don't how, think so. How dare you now, use that as an example? Now, how dare you try to example. make that argument? We uh, did not say 800,000 DACA people I'm a former were federal prosecutor. I know. Mark Kerkorian just said that. So don't tell me Laura, that Laura, we Laura, said something Can I that we say something, say. or you want to Donald talk Trump over me? Donald Trump should get a new immigration lawyer. We're out of time. If you <laughs> Laura, thought they were just former coming federal prosecutor, use better you're wrong. The potentially invasive tactics from Silicon Valley could affect all of you up next. Facebook, Twitter, Google are hardly friends of conservatives, but I use them all. But its own workers accuse Facebook of suppressing conservative news from its list of trending stories. Very interesting. Twitter employees have allegedly admitted to censoring and banning conservatives. And studies show Google's algorithms produce search results favoring Democrats and other liberals. How shocking. Now Facebook reportedly plans to put cameras and microphones in your home in one handy new device. No thanks. What could possibly go wrong? For answers, let's go to Steve Hilton, Fox News host of The Next Revolution with Steve Hilton. He's in Silicon Valley and in New York. Kristen Ruby, who is president of the Ruby Media Group. All right, Kristen, let's start with you. Why should we not be concerned that, let's start with the issue of fact-checking conservative news sites and not fact-checking more liberal news sites. Daily Caller uh, is subjected to routinely fact-checking and context comments by uh, Twitter, uh, and that's done regularly. Uh, that's actually, yeah, you know, that's the uh, Google, uh, the Google look. And yet Vox and other more liberal sites don't actually get that treatment. Is that fair? Do I think it's fair? Absolutely not. So I think we should be concerned about this. However, I think this is really a case of what happens when you have smaller startups with not a plan, really, to think about becoming some of the largest corporations in the world, right? And so I think a lot of this is actually missteps and lack of planning. Um, I don't disagree that, yes, they are actually doing this, but I do think that at this point, these are advertising uh, revenue-dependent sites. So people have the power to actually cut off and stop advertising with these sites um, instead of just right, tweeting Right, but wait a second. It. Ruby, Ruby, the, the problem is, is if, for instance, Google, if they skew the analytics to hurt conservative media, that hurts conservative media bottom line as well, does it not? I mean, that hurts their ad revenue because it does. the analytics don't match the traffic on the site. That's the concern I think a lot of the, uh, a lot of the conservative sites have here, and that seems just patently unfair. Very quickly, then I want to go to Steve. 
I agree with you. I'm not, I'm not disagreeing on this point. I think it is unfair, and I think they have to get their act together very quickly. And I think consumers really have the power to change this by cutting off ad, ad revenue for them, basically. Well, I mean, it's Google. I don't know where you're going to cut off Google. But, Steve, uh, on this particular issue, uh, I've seen it. I've seen this happen. We know lots of people on Twitter who are banned because they have conservative views that are provocative. But, my goodness, what on Twitter isn't provocative these days? Look at my Twitter feed sometime. Uh, what should we think about this? I think we should be really, really concerned, Laura. And, and, and before I dive into that, I just want to say it's my first time joining you. I want to say how much I love your show. I watch every oh, night. You are you. a great champion for populism. And thank this you. is a real populist issue because this is about the people versus the powerful. And there's nothing more powerful these days than these tech companies. And the reason we should be frightened, there's two reasons, basically. First of all, exactly as you said, they want us to put our whole lives in their hands, to show up to our homes in their self-driving cars, walk up to the front door and facial recognition software will open the door, we could throw away the boring old keys, walk into the kitchen and the smart fridge will have ordered your groceries and you stick it in the smart oven. All of that personal information, deeply personal data, who owns that? Not us. They own it. And what's going to happen with it? You don't know because the la latest thing they've told us is that every single chip and every single computer in the world has actually got a design flaw, which means it can be hacked by anyone. But there's the hackable. ideological problem too. They hide. That's right, and they, they hide behind this, this, this notion of the algorithm that does all this in a neutral, unbiased way. But the truth is, as anyone who knows about these tech companies really understands, is that the algorithms are written by people. And the people who work for these companies are overwhelmingly liberal. And that's a real problem because they're designing these systems that run so much of our lives with an ideological bias. And it's worse even than that because they're not just liberal, they're liberal hypocrites too. Because while they politically shovel money into the pockets of Democrats who obviously want to raise taxes and increase regulations, they themselves, these tech companies, do all they can to avoid paying taxes and they spend millions of dollars on lobbyists to avoid being regulated. So they want everyone else to pay taxes, just not them. And they want other industries to be regulated, just not theirs. It's really dangerous and we've got to now, fight the, back. The best, the best is when Mark Zuckerberg you know, buys all the properties around his house and makes sure that he has a perimeter. So he, he has a lot of security. Like, what's the, di exactly. what's the difference? by the way between uh, breaking and entering uh, uh, you know the house and breaking and entering the country but that's not how it works guys great segment and by the way Obama's idea of a presidential library apparently includes no books or even documents up next a few more reasons why Chicago may say no thanks to the plans for the Obama library Okay, stay here, because this is wild. Controversy is actually swirling around the Obama Presidential Library. It was supposed to be administered by the National Archives, only the Obama Presidential Center is going to contain no books. And it's more like a privately operated entertainment campus with a recording studio. He's still dining out on that Al Green thing he did years ago, that, <laughs> that karaoke. And I guess he's going to have, is there a workout room or basketball court? Now a growing number of people are objecting to its construction on what's historic parkland. Park land. And one of them is Charles Birnbaum. He's a chief executive of the Cultural Landscape Foundation. He joins us uh, from West Palm Beach, obviously not Chicago, but he's spearheading this effort on behalf of a lot of Chicago residents. Um, Charles, no books. Uh, no, we don't know where the archives are, the documents. I mean, uh, explain this. Well, first of all, Laura, thank you for covering this. Uh, this is a national story, and we at the Cultural Landscape Foundation are grateful that you have picked this up. So tremendous kudos. Um, you're right. It's not a library. What it is is a bait and switch. What Chicagoans were told when this went to the park board, that we would actually have a library and the confiscation of parkland held in public trust for 150 years was offered up. And now what we're seeing is a private enterprise in the confiscation of public parkland. This is pure and simple. It's outrageous. By this the way, the it's really ugly. Law. It's really ugly, too. I'm sorry. It looks like some, I don't know what it looks like. It looks like a, some kind of spaceship. Or, I, it's, it's not attractive. I don't understand. But Rahm Emanuel, we, it was a very short segment. I'm going to have you on radio tomorrow on this. But uh, I guess Rahm Emanuel basically said whatever you need, correct? 
whatever you need to Obama. They wanted a, this big swath of land, whatever you need. This was actually land that the, the deal was made with the University of Chicago. Imagine when this competition was happening if Columbia University said, oh, no. we're going to take 19 areas, 19 acres of Forget Central it. Park. They would have been laughed out of town. All right, town. we're going to continue this on radio. Of... Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. We're going to continue this on radio tomorrow. Uh, by the way, bonus angle coming up. CEOs who abandoned Trump back in August. Guess what's happening with them now? Where are they now? Coming up. Welcome back. The summer of their discontent made glorious winter. CEOs and the Trump economy, that's the focus of tonight's bonus angle. Okay, do you remember back in August when several CEOs on President Trump's two business advisory councils resigned over his comments after that Charlottesville uh, protest? Uh, white supremacists, all that stuff going on there. Well, of course, left-wing cable hosts and journalists were positively gleeful last August when that was going down. President Trump was losing his allies in corporate America. Well, they ran for cover, those CEOs, at the first sign of trouble, and they caved when Trump haters made the absurd claim that Trump was sympathetic to white supremacists. Look at all those headlines. Can't even read them. There's so many. Well, typical of uh, most CEOs in the modern era, they preen and they posture as morally superior, and then they try to outdo one another and, I'm politically correct. No, I'm more politically correct. Well, they jumped off the USS Trump when they thought Trump was sinking because they wanted to try to save themselves. So courageous. Well, naturally, the media ate it up. It's a punch in the gut to Mr. Trump, a billionaire former CEO who ran as the jobs president. He needed corporate America to back his claims that he was a businessman president who could get things done with their help. Now they have turned their backs on him. This is a huge embarrassing blow for President Trump. They're not afraid of President Trump anymore. At this point, he has said so much but done so little, and we're so far away from his agenda. Oh, tell us, Stephanie. But the real reason, of course, the press was giddy is because they thought the exodus of all those corporate chieftains made it certain that the entire Trump agenda would be over. Finney. Well, could they have been more wrong? The truth is, the president, despite his unconventional approach, has demonstrated that he's smarter and more in tune with the people than these business leaders will ever be. In fact, they're now the ones cheering. Consider the recent news. In the wake of the tax reform, Walmart announced today that it's raising starting wages for hourly employees to $11 an hour. It's also giving $1,000 bonuses to some of its hourly employees. Now, Walmart credited the salary hikes and the bonuses to the president's tax cuts. And by the way, they're not alone. Waste management, Comcast, AT&T, and many others have made similar moves. This is real money in people's pockets. Politically, this puts Democrats in something of a trick bag. The economy's humming, manufacturing is up. But remember what Nancy Pelosi said when that tax bill passed. This is Armageddon. Uh, this is a very big deal. Well, once again, she was sputtering on the House floor about it today. In terms of the bonus that corporate America received versus the crumbs that they are giving to workers to kind of put the schmooze on is so pathetic. Think about how elitist that is. Crumbs, $2,000 bonus from uh, waste management to 34,000 employees, Nancy. Maybe it's a crumb if you live in Pacific Heights or in uh, Seacliff neighborhood of San Francisco and you're married to Paul Pelosi, maybe then it's a crumb. But for most people, it's real money. And they say, by the way, that Trump doesn't have uh, both oars in the water. Nancy's lost the oars and can't even find the water. She's so out of it. Now, it uh, must be a great relief to the Democrats and that in their moment of confusion, their dear former leader, President Barack Obama, is giving them tons of moral support and clarity as he chatted with Dave Letterman on Netflix. Prince 
ask Sasha to come up and dance, who, and she's an excellent dancer. Then Sasha s pulls me up, which surprises me because she always mocks my dancing, but <laughs> I have dad moves. Yeah. And I, and I think the key is, is what we call staying in the pocket. Sure. <laughs> St right? Staying so in the pocket. You've got to stay in the pocket. Oh, my goodness. I'm glad he's reminiscing about all those taxpayer-funded private concerts at the White House while his party scrambles for relevance. And meanwhile, 